is a small country in a turbulent neighborhood. It's seen the influx of millions of refugees from Syria, Iraq and the Palestinian territories. It's suffering its own economic crisis with high unemployment and protests over tax reforms. But in the area of healthcare, it's made huge strides. The King Hussein Cancer Foundation has become one of the leading NGOs in the region for cancer care. And its transformation has been accomplished by a woman who campaigns tirelessly for better healthcare for cancer patients everywhere in the world. She's a member of Jordan's ruling royal family. She's also the first Arab Muslim to take the presidency of the global cancer control organization, the UICC with World Cancer Day on February the 4th. I speak to Her Royal Highness Princess Dina Mired of Jordan, one-on-one. -on -one. Had I been an underprivileged person in Jordan, I would not be able to call myself a mother of a cancer survivor. Are we gonna be the generation that's gonna just sit back and see 18.1 million new cancer cases. Iraq and Syria were our top trading partners. You can imagine how much it has impacted our, our economy. Do I see myself as a role model? No one does. No one does, really. You call yourself the mother of a cancer survivor. Tell us about that time and how it felt when you learned of Rakan's illness and what it was going to take to put him on the road to recovery. Well, first of all, lovely having you here. Um, very happy to be doing this interview with TRT World and especially with you, Shuli. We've already become fast friends and I'm very happy about that. Um, yes, uh, when we, uh, in 1997, November 1997, two days short of my uh, son Rakan's uh, second birthday, we found out he had uh, leukemia. Of course, like any other parent, uh, you know, and especially in those days when nobody spoke about cancer in 1990, certainly not here in Jordan, it was never on the radar on any young parents, to say the least. Uh, we felt the same feelings that one would feel, shock, horror, uh, guilt, why didn't I discover it earlier? Um, worry, worry that you're going to lose the most, your most precious um, with a disease that we all thought it equates to death because that's how it was in 1997. And uh, it was a very, very sad, fearful time with lots of worry and uh, you know, the usual emotions that one feels when you are faced with such news as this. As a parent, as, and a, as parent, a family, as it a parent, must have been a terrible a family, time. It was an awful time. But to be honest, then, you know, as parents, you quickly, you know, beyond the first few days when you, of course, you're going to cry and wonder, and why me? What else could we have done? And, and you know, what else could we have picked up? And, and so on. Uh, you snap up, so you snap into action because you realize that now you have a child to help save, of course, with the team that is at the hospital and so on. And that's, we were at the time, we happened to be in England and we were at Edinburgh's hospital. That's when, that's when the first news uh, broke, were, was broken to us that uh, Rakan had leukemia. And he has since recovered happily with the help of a bone marrow transplant from his sister. But that really set you on the journey to what you do now, which is passionately advocate for equality of access to health care for all patients, regardless of their income, all around the world. Well, after we finished, you know, uh, the treatment, we first, of course, finished the um, the chemotherapy treatment in the beginning we were at Edinburgh's at the time and then we moved to the US because we were told that you need to go to a place that has that deals with more bone marrow transplants more volume and so on so we went over there and after the treatment finished and we came back here in Jordan believe it or not you know we were so fearful to come back because yes we did have at the time a cancer center it used to be called the hope center I noticed the omission of the word cancer in the name we just used to i used to pass by it every day on the way to see my parents 
and we just ignored it. It was a, a building. Yes, it had fantastic machinery. Um, uh, the, the infrastructure was there, but it wasn't known to be a place where it saves lives. And certainly um, there was so much taboo at the time. Because uh, at that time, a, a diagnosis of cancer was basically a death, death sentence. Death, death sentence. So we were so fearful to come back because, you know, we felt, what if something happens again? What do we do? And, and it was a very difficult time for us. Is that when it, it hit you that healthcare wasn't adequate in Jordan? Yes, certainly I felt very appreciative of the fact that we were of the lucky few who were able to get top treatment, be it in England and then later in the US. And certainly, you know, if I had to think for one second that had I been an underprivileged person in Jordan, I would not have had this chance. And certainly I would not have be able to call myself a mother of a cancer survivor. And that's when I was asked to join the King Hussein Cancer Foundation at the time and to become the director general uh, for the institution. And at the time... You transformed that institution yes, through and your that's hard when work. I, and, and, and there was nothing in the foundation. It was just a legal entity and there was this cancer center. They used to be called the Hope Center. And um, when I, so when I entered uh, with the foundation, it really started from scratch. And it wasn't just me, it's, you know, nobody does anything all sure. by themselves. There was, of course, there was the center, the Hope Center at the time. It, we had the machinery, it had staff. And as you know, healthcare in general in Jordan, in terms of capacities, human resources, it's there. We are highly educated people. But having, uh, operating a cancer center or managing cancer control in a center, that requires a whole different uh, mindset and a whole different skills. Managing it and resourcing it and, resourcing and funding it. it. It's a different story altogether. So at the time, you know, despite having this wonderful center and, th and we thank all the people before us who built it and it was there, but it wasn't saving lives. So we worked very hard together with the, um, the board of trustees, uh, the CEO of the center at the time, uh, and myself at the foundation, we were like a tripartite team working together, first of all, to put cancer on the agenda, to put it on top of mind, to out it actually, because at the time nobody would even speak the word cancer. They would refer to it as that disease, or God forbid, that disease. And so how are you going to, you know, fight a disease when you haven't even, you know, admitted that it exists and so on? So we all started to uh, look into what we can do, and the first thing we thought, why reinvent the wheel? Uh, I went to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital at the time, and I'm very thankful for them because I learned everything that I needed to learn. In those five days I went, and I was actually pregnant with my third child, Jafar, and um, met everybody. I was like a wonderful student sitting there, talking to them, understanding how they do fundraising, uh, what are the systems for fundraising? How do you do it professionally? Because clearly, if you're going to fundraise for cancer, and we needed to fundraise a whole lot of money to be able to uh, bring the uh, you know, cancer care up to scratch. Because this is one of the big problems, right? That yes. poverty directly impacts on people's access to both treatment, to totally. preventative measures, totally. to screening. Totally. Yes. I mean, you know, um, I think many people in the Western world, yes, they might have some issues with their healthcare systems, but you know, they have them. They have the universal health coverage. It might not be perfect in so many ways, but it's there. And certainly when you are faced with such diseases, such so complex and so costly, such as cancer, you're really so lucky to have those, uh, the access, the financial access for those, because you know, access, as I always say, it's such a simplified word when you say access to cancer care. Access to cancer care has so many meanings. You know, access to information, access to awareness, um, access to, or, or let's say, beating the barriers to access, such as stigma, such as taboo, uh, fear, etc. And then you, uh, access to uh, cancer care facilities, if you have one or you live near one. And if you have one, do you have access to a quality care uh, uh, facility? That's another issue. Because as we all know, cancer knows no mediocrity. You know, you either get treated to the top 
of protocols uh, for cancer care or don't bother, right? Because the side effects are, can be very deb debilitating. Um, and then you have, of course, if you, have, if you happen to have access to a cancer facility in your own country, uh, then what about uh, having the financial means to pay for it? And that's the story of many countries. And this is something that you uh, talk a lot about in your role yes. as president of the Union yes. for International Cancer Control. You are the first non-medical person to take the helm of that organization and also the first Arab Muslim. Uh, what are your goals for your presidency of that organization? Well, first of all, um, I, I put myself up for election because I bring in uh, different perspectives. First of all, as a mother of a cancer survivor and a carer for a child with cancer, I bring in the patient perspective. Uh, second of all, coming from the developing world, uh, I bring in that perspective. Of course, you know, many people know about the situation in the developing world, but I've lived it. I've seen it. When you talk about lack of access, I've seen a child being turned away because there is parents didn't have money. Or uh, I've seen all of these tragic cases that you talk about, not from textbooks, but I've seen it and I've lived it. And thirdly, being having been a director general of the King Hussein Cancer Foundation for 15 years and starting from scratch, you know, building the foundation, the structure, the human resources, understanding um, the awareness challenges or the lack of awareness about cancer, um, the lack of money for cancer uh, and so on, um, and the systems and the organizational capacities. And that's what I would say many of the issues of the developing world is very much organizational and systematic way of dealing with cancer I mean, control. You clearly have the so knowledge in the background. To, I'm over, yes, I'm able to bring that. So what I would like to do during my presidency is uh, to continue fighting for equity, for cancer treatment for all. And this is um, actually what's the theme for our world um, cancer uh, at UICC. I am and I will. And we're calling for treatment for all. Because, um, yes, we are focusing on treatment, but of course we also focus on the whole cancer spectrum. You know, prevention, early detection, treatment, palliative care. Um, survivorship but and so all on. Of this but requires, treatment is the big elephant in the room. All of this requires commitment from governments. Yes. And you have spoken before about the slow pace of change. You were speaking at the UN uh, last year yes. and there was uh, definite frustration uh, in your speech about how far we've yes. got. This is something, reducing cancer deaths is, is a UN goal, it's a World Health Organization goal. Why is it so slow to be achieved? Actually, um, more than half of the countries in the world have, are way behind in uh, improving cancer control in their own countries. And this is really frustrating, especially since the global advocacy world, the health community, we've really uh, moved the agenda forward from 2011 when I first spoke as well at the UN high level meeting where we were full of hope and we thought the fact that we have uh, fought the denial about uh, non-communicable diseases and cancer being of course one of the uh, big uh, non-communicable diseases we thought once we uh, uh, break down the denial about that developing worlds don't suffer from non-communicable disease, that everything will be okay. And we've gone through the plans, the action plans, we framed our and reframed our um, cause to make sure that countries start uh, implementing all the advice and all the uh, initiatives so, and all the so policy what's going guidance on? Why aren't and they so doing on. it? And really they're not doing it. Lack of political will is one. Uh, prioritization. Uh, lack of planning. Planning, again, I go back very much to the management of cancer control. How are you gonna, you know, in your day-to-day -day life and, or in any successful business, you put, you know, you, pro you put a goal, you prioritize, after that you do a strategy, you, based on the strategy you put an action plan, you put date, time, person responsible and so on. 
Many countries are not doing that. They, well, many countries don't have national cancer plans. So many how governments don't have the money to do that. So how can but they implement cancer yeah. plans when they have conflicts and, and poverty and diseases like AIDS and malaria to do that? Yeah, with? but that's not the whole story. Not everything requires money. For example, if I talk about palliative care, providing proper palliative care for many patients who don't survive the disease, and, and certainly 70% in the... Uh, of deaths are in the developing world. This doesn't require that much money. It requires planning, organization, and prioritization. Morphine is very cheap. Many countries, they, they are able to buy it, but they don't distribute it. They don't disseminate it. So it's not a question of money, it's a question of uh, bureaucracy. Do you feel that uh, one of the things you bring to the table is the fact that you are royalty, you are a princess. Does that make it easier to open up doors and, and talk to the, the policy makers and the decision makers who can uh, influence these decisions? Well, you know, the title, of course, it does open up doors. You know, I am able to meet top leaders, uh, presidents, uh, uh, and decision makers. Yes, I am able. So that's opening the door, that's one. So, and I've seen, you know, and that's really good um, to be able to do that. Um, but at the end of the day, those countries have to roll up their sleeves and decide, you know, are they going to be just waiting to see, you know, are we going to be the generation, all these governments who do nothing, are we going to be the generation that's going to just sit back and see 18.1 million new cancer cases every year and accept that 9.6 million per year die and 70% of which in our own countries, in the developing countries. They have to decide, are they just going to sit back and do nothing or start doing something? Whether on prevention with tobacco, you cut down 30%. You cut down lung cancer and it has been proven. Or whether with screening and early detection, cervical cancer. Many countries uh, suffer from cervical and it can be prevented, it can be screened. Um, breast cancer, we did it. We are, and that's, the thing is, I think, where I bring to the table is I can tell those countries, we've done it. Jordan isn't exactly a rich country. We're a medium to low income country, resource country. And, and our story is proof of the pudding. Before the King Hussein Cancer Center's success, Jordan used to send the few to be treated abroad, wasting millions and millions of dollars, actually improving or, or giving revenue to other hospitals abroad. But when we finally fixed our own cancer center, we've cut the bill by, I would say, 60%, because here, you know, cancer treatment is much cheaper. It's certainly not the same as in the US um, and Europe, I suppose. And at the same time, being able to deliver quality cancer care, not only for the few, but to the whole population. So we've done it. It is doable. Uh, was it easy? No, it wasn't. But it was very important that, and, and I tell this all the time during my visits, you know, you can't sit passively waiting for help from other countries. You still have to do your own homework. Find out what you can do, remove inefficiencies, remove barriers, and then you ask for help. Let's talk a little bit about Jordan, because Jordan, as you said, small country, low to middle income, um, it has been impacted massively by the war in Syria, by the conflict in Iraq. It's generously taken in over a million refugees. How has that changed Jordan, though? Definitely. I mean, the, uh, Jordan is such a lovely country, by the way. It has really, this is not the first time we accept refugees. Jordan has accepted Palestinian refugees, 1948, 1967, then the Iraqis from Gulf War number one, Gulf War number two, and then now, of course, with the Syrian crisis, we've accepted more than a million plus uh, refugees. So it has definitely impacted many things. Certainly the health and educational sector has been really, really overburdened. And when I was director general at the King Hussein Cancer Foundation, I saw that. And what I really saw, and I was very surprised, is how little the humanitarian agencies, such as UNHCR HCR and WHO, uh, you know, how little they have in terms of resources to help refugees with cancer and non-communicable diseases. 
um, they're mainly geared for emergency type uh, situation, uh, but they have absolutely hardly any money for cancer. Is it changing the, the nature? Is it changing the atmosphere in Jordan? Is Jordan finding it a, a struggle? For example, dealing with the financial burden of looking after so many refugees at a time when its economy is really struggling. Of course, we have been impacted. Don't forget that, you know, Iraq and Syria were our top trading partners, uh, to say the least. So having that, um, you know, diminished or even stopped, you can imagine how much it has impacted our, our economy. And then to add to the mix um, all the other issues in the Middle East, um, and uh, the Syrian crisis and having, and of course, accepting our brothers and sisters from Syria. And I don't think this was an issue ever, whether to accept or not to accept, because this is the way of the leadership. Jordan has accepted so many refugees. Do you think that international organizations are doing enough to help with the, the humanitarian challenges that they're facing and with the, the financial burden that Jordan is facing? Well, um, they're not doing enough. And we have to remember that actually WHO and UNHCR, they get their money or their support from uh, member countries, from governments. So in a way, they should be uh, seeking uh, more assistance from those countries to help um, refugee, the refugee population um, as a whole. Meaning, you cannot just look at a refugee and think that this refugee is only suffering from emergency care. These refugees are humans, just like you and me, who are also mirroring the same diseases that we all suffer from. Uh, and if NCDs are the number one killers right now in our time, uh, killing 18.1 or, or, uh, or affecting 18.1 uh, cases per year, many of those will happen to be refugees as well. So they need to start demanding more monies from governments around the world so that when there is an, a refugee situation, and, and apparently we've seen you know, it's a record number of refugees all over the world, not just uh, in Jordan, um, they need to rethink their assistance for the refugee population to include non-communicable diseases and to include cancer. And they, they've started recently, I think, with diabetes, uh, the diabetic medications and so on, but cancer has received very little, uh, if none. Um, so they need to really demand uh, more forcefully, um, more assistance and care uh, with regards to cancer. Do you think the refugees, the refugees themselves population. feel abandoned? Do you think refugees feel that not enough is, is being done for Absolutely. them? Absolutely. I mean, I've seen, um, I mean, we've, we've helped uh, during my tenure as Director General of the King Hussein Cancer Foundation, we've had to help so many Syrian children or, uh, and patients through our goodwill funds, um, from donor goodwill funds. We've helped so many, uh, and I, th I believe to this day, but we cannot help uh, a whole population all by ourselves. We, are, we, we were a, and we are a non-governmental organization after all. And of course they know that some die, uh, some get underreported, some don't even know where to go and where to start. Um, and because of their situation, if they do come, they, uh, they present themselves very late when there's very little to be done for them and so on. Um, there are so many tragic situations that we don't even know about of um, refugee population, many patients dying uh, without no chance for even trying to beat the disease. Can I ask you, um, you are very much a role model, uh, particularly for Arab women. Um, you have helped to change healthcare on a global, regional and national level. Uh, you've done all of that while raising three beautiful children. What is, what is your goal? How, where is Your Highness Princess Dina Mirad's future? How, what do you want to achieve for you? Do you have time for you? Oh, for me, for me. Um, I haven't thought about that actually because I've been so busy and you know, my focus right now is to utilize my position as president of this wonderful organization, the Union for International Cancer Control and to really utilize 
um, what I bring into the role, and to advocate in wherever I go. Um, go do you see yourself as a role model? Yeah, um, well, you know, what is a role model, right? Nobody's perfect, but I feel like I want to uh, make sure that I knock on all doors and put in the hard work that is necessary to advocate for treatment for all people, regardless of where they live, regardless of their income level, um, because that's their right for to be able to face the disease of our times, which is cancer. Um, do I see myself as a role model? No one does. <laughs> no one does, really. But I, I feel I am uh, trying my best, and I think this is what the most... Uh, you know, trying to improve oneself all the time. Well, this it's been what one... an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much indeed, Your Highness, for speaking with TRC World. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.